Chapter 15 Father, Brother, Son My first real music outside of Anthrax was Altitudes and Attitude, a duo with David Ellison of Megadeth. I love what we've done with that band. And it all started with a series of bass clinics that Harky, my amp company, asked us to do after the Big Four shows. David's tone really grabbed me at those shows. I always check out other bass players because if I hear a cool tone, maybe I can incorporate it into my playing. You always have to have an open mind. Don't be locked in. So David was coming out with this killer sound at Soundcheck, and he took me through what he was using on his rig and let me try it. He then hooked me up with Harky, and those guys have been amazing to me ever since. I said to the guys at Harky, I want to get out and do clinics because people should know what base products are good and they can get for a decent price. So David and I went out and did a bunch of them. That's how Altitudes and Attitude got started. He said to me one day at one of these clinics when we were jamming, why don't we write some original songs? I had quite a few songs that I had written, and so did he. So we got Anthrax's producer, Jay Rustin, on board, and I got rolling with the lyrics. We really wanted to do this project, and we put all our efforts into it. The songs really tie in with the things we've talked about in this book, and they've been therapeutic for me. One small downside is that some people get weird when they see me playing a guitar rather than a bass, because they feel like I've been taken out of my usual role. But I explained to them, with no disrespect intended, that I've been playing guitar since the very beginning. Of course, if someone cares about a detail as small as that, then I take it as a compliment, because presumably they're a fan of what I do. I know that Steve Harris writes songs on bass, and in fact, I've asked him how he does it. I understand that you can write a bass line like it goes through a song, of course, but for me, the song flows better when you write it on guitar. You can include major and minor chords, which allows the angst in me to come out way easier. I'll write the chords on the guitar, and then right after that, I'll go to the bass. I love passing on my knowledge at those Harky clinics, and a few years later, I enjoyed taking part in some little kids' rock events for the same reason. The charity asked me to talk to some kids about playing in a band, and I said, sure, whatever I can do, and I went to talk to the kids about how important music is. It was like doing a clinic without doing the clinician stuff, because it was really about passing the spirit of the music along. We gave them a bunch of basses, and it felt great to see them play my signature instruments. Again, it's all about passing the torch, and that is very, very important for everybody. Anthrax has been busy touring ever since the big four shows, with only one lineup change. That was in 2013, when Rob left to join Volbeat. He got an offer to produce the Volbeat record and then join them, which I totally understood. I'm a Volbeat fan, and I'm friends with those guys. We went on tour with them and we had a fucking blast. It was great to see Rob join them. I was and still am happy for him because that band is where he belongs. I talk to him all the time because he only lives like 10 minutes from me. Rob recommended John Donay from Shadows Fall to take his place. And we've been very lucky with that because it was totally seamless. John is the most easygoing guy in the world and a great fucking guitar player. In 2013, we released a covers EP, Anthems. And if anybody knows Anthrax, they know from the B-sides we put out through the years that all we do is jam other people's songs. We're all big Radiohead fans, for example. We have previously covered their song, The Bends. I think that band is underrated, and they don't get enough promotion for the great music they're putting out right now. The same year, we toured with Testament and Death Angel, and we did the Metal Alliance tour with Exodus. I want people to know how great these tours were with those bands, who are some of my best friends in the world. When we tour with these guys, there's like such a home feeling, from Chuck Billy to Alex Skolnick to Mark Asagueya, all of those guys. We've become like family with them, and they're all very good people. The great thing about these tours is that I'm able to watch the other bands and get off on their performances. I want to see everybody in those shows do well, from the opening band to the middle band to the headliner. I want the crowd to be fucking floored. That's so important. I want everybody to play the greatest show they have ever played so everybody has a great experience. You know, in the early days, we probably would have been competing with those other bands. But over the last couple of years, I just want to enjoy it because you realize that it could all be taken away in an instant, just like that. When we're in the moment, I always think to myself, 
How fucking lucky are we? How lucky are we to be able to stand on the side and watch our friends play such killer music? Our most recent album, For All Kings, came out in 2016, and we worked hard on it. Because, let's face it, these songs are what you have to live with for the next three years. That's the way I look at it in Anthrax. I want to live with the songs. So when we have these arguments about writing, my argument is that I have to fucking live with them for how many hundreds of shows for the next three years. That's why I want to make sure every part is right. It took five years to release For All Kings after worship music. People ask about that five-year gap, and I totally understand the question because I'm also one of those fans that says, what the fuck were you doing all that time? But when you look at our touring schedule and the amount of time that took out of every year, it makes sense. Anthrax has never been one of those bands that can write records on the road. You've got to make sure that the songs are lived with, and you need to make sure that they're the best of the best. We went out with Lamb of God, we went out twice with Kill Switch and Gage, we did tons of touring. We never stopped, and that's all good, because it means the previous album was successful, and that a lot of people want to see you play. With the new album, we thought we had lightning in a bottle. We really did, and it turned out that it did cross over the way we needed, and people understood what it was exactly the way we wanted them to. A lot of people used the word rebirth to describe it, which was good of them, and we appreciated that they did that. But for me, Anthrax has always been a constant, so it was never a rebirth. As I saw it, we never really went away. Still, I was excited about this new record, because I was happy that this reunion happened in such a great way. The quality is right there, on the record, and how great is that? You don't have to say anything when the proof is in the pudding. The record spoke for itself, and thankfully, people caught on to it. And I say that humbly, because you don't know which way it's going to go. Our fans are smart enough to understand that it's all from the heart in our band, and thankfully, they've stayed around all this time. Okay, here's another good story. We did a South American tour with Iron Maiden. On their own plane. Time to grab a drink and listen up. First off, imagine me. Some guy from the Bronx being in a band that was opening for Iron Maiden in South America. Maiden has always been and will always be one of my favorite bands of all time. Before this tour, we'd played Iron Maiden shows and enjoyed some great packed to capacity tours with them with a great fan base. I loved Iron Maiden's fans, a lot of whom became Anthrax fans after they saw us play, which was awesome. But had we done anything on the scale of this specific tour? <laughs> Hell no. When we heard about it, we went nuts. This was a stadium tour. A stadium tour in South America. Right off the bat, when you hear that, your mind is blown. Because you know Iron Maiden is one of the world's biggest bands and that they can sell out stadiums, specifically in South America. When my manager said those words to me, I started babbling immediately and saying, No fucking way. You're fucking kidding. The kid inside me came out at that moment the kid who met Steve Harris in that pub nearly 40 years ago. And here's the cherry on top. We were going to travel on Maiden's plane, Air Force One, with them, with their singer Bruce Dickinson flying it. I didn't know whether to scream or shit my pants. Everything you could ever dream of as an Iron Maiden fan was coming true at this moment. I had a lot of great times with them before this, and I thanked them for that. But I never thought something like this would ever be possible. Just like I never thought Anthrax could ever play Yankee Stadium. Even after the tour was confirmed, I still really couldn't believe it was happening. All the way down to Monterey in Mexico, where we were meeting Maiden and getting on their plane, I was predicting that somehow it wasn't going to work out because it was just too good to be true. When we arrived in Monterey and got our first glimpse of Ed Force One, parked on the runway at the airport, we couldn't believe our eyes. I was like, is this really going to happen? Are they really going to let us on? I was like a little kid. It was a huge Boeing 747, and all of our band, our crew, and all our gear went on it. I was wondering if there would be special zones for everyone with security and everything, but it was totally relaxed. You'd think they'd have Iron Maiden in the front and keep us in the back, but no. Maiden did have an upstairs room, but the production coordinator, Zeb Minto, who is a friend for life and who has always looked out for Anthrax, 
gave us all business class seats and took care of our families and the cruise families too. Imagine as you're sipping a beer while listening to this in the pub or at home or wherever you are, what it's like to be an Iron Maiden fan traveling like this on the way to play sold out stadiums. It doesn't get better than that in this life. I want you to understand how I felt sitting in that seat. And remember what a business class seat means if you come from a childhood of poverty. No wonder I was scared shitless that this was all going to go away any second. I just sat there and tried not to get in the way. I'm friends with Maiden, but I didn't want to take up any of their time because this was their home territory. Steve and Nico would come up and say, How you doing, Frank? And I'd say, Great, but I, I don't want to get in your way. They'd say, Oh, stop. Enjoy yourself. Have a drink. You had a trooper yet? I remember Steve giving us a case of ice cold trooper beer to welcome us to the tour. He knew we were loving every second of this and he wanted to make sure he got it right. That's class. Iron Maiden know how to do it right, from the manager on down to the crew, who I'm very close to. Steve is still showing me how it's done, all these years after he first showed me how it's done in New York in 1982. Gene, too, he never let anything get in the way of his path, and that's very inspirational. You don't need to let things derail you if you have a goal in mind. If I'd gone out on Friday night when I was a teenager instead of staying in and learning to play a rush song on bass, it would have derailed me. Why do it? That same year, how the fuck we got all this stuff done in a single year, I have no idea. We went on tour in North America again, this time with Slayer and Death Angel. We played in Atlanta one night, and because we're all die-hard Walking Dead fans, we went out to the set when we were there. We went through the town where they shoot it, we went backstage, we went into the writing room. They couldn't have been nicer to us. If you're into Walking Dead, you might know that Norman Reedus, the actor who plays Daryl Dixon, is a huge rock and metal fan. We ate and drank with him and had a great fucking day, and then we went back to do our show. It was one of those great days that makes you think one more time how fortunate you are to do this. That night, Norma came to watch the show from the side of the stage. I knew he dabbled in bass, so I was busting his chops before we went on, saying, Come up and play bass with us tonight. He said, No. Although I could see he kind of wanted to say yes. When the show started, Norman was at the side of the stage, totally getting into it, just jamming with himself and getting into the headbanging. So I went over to him, stuck a bass around his neck and said, Dude, let's do this. He walked out with me and the crowd went fucking wild because this super famous guy had walked on stage with us. He didn't know the songs, but it didn't matter because we were having such a blast. I walked him through some bass parts and then he took off. What a badass that guy is. And a great fucking actor too. Like I said before, I'm a fan who likes to hang out at the side of the stage too. And when we played on Slayer's final tour in 2019, I was right there every single night. There's a lot of pictures online of me on the side of the stage. You know those guys are all my friends. I love their music and I love the band. And because I know this is not forever, later on in life, I want to remember these times. I want to have them in the catalog of my memory and say, I want to go back to that event because it was such a fucking great time. Just saying that to you now unlocks another memory door for me. The times we had on the tour we did with Pantera. Every night after the Anthrax set, as soon as I dried off from the shower, I was on the side of the stage with a beer in my hand watching them because I knew how fucking special it was. I knew it wasn't going to last, of course, even though you want it to last forever. But I didn't know that it was going to be taken away in the way that it unfortunately was. But I knew how special Pantera was. I was on Rex Brown's side of the stage every night, and when Rex came over, we did a fucking shot. It was our thing, man, and I want people to understand that, which is why I'm talking about how much love I have for it. I wish you could have been on the side of the stage next to me, with Pantera fucking rocking out, loving every song, rallying them on, and watching the crowd go absolutely apeshit. Rex would come over and shout, Let's go! We'd slam a shot down, and then, holy shit, Dime would come over, and we'd do another one. I was fucking plowed by the end. But I was such a fan that it was important for me to be on the side of the stage. It's where your heart is, and it's the best feeling in the world. I love it. I'm really not joking when I say that I wish you, my friend hearing this right now, could have been there with me. Imagine if you were there, just waiting for the time when Rex got that look in his eye, like, it's on. 
and then you knew that the shot was coming. He'd be telling his crew to get this specific guy that they employed just to fucking pour whiskey. They really had a specific guy who did that. And you're thinking, can I handle this one? Can I handle one more? Then the guy comes over and gives you one of these fucking things, which is a half glass of Crown Royal with a little tiny bit of Coke in it. Those days are gone, which is sad, but it's how life goes. What's important is that you enjoy the good times and hold on to them in your memory and learn from them, as I hope this book has made clear along the way. Me? I'm grateful for everything that happened in the run-up to working on this book. Altitudes and Attitude released the album, Get It Out. You think the title might have anything to do with the things I've talked about here? And Anthrax played the Mega Cruise in 2019, one of the last things we did before the world shut down for a couple of years. We've been working on a new album during the pandemic. Who knows, it might be on the way by the time you hear this. I've also worked on some cool collaborations. My friend Bill Kellier from Mastodon asked me if I wanted to be part of a cover of Faith No More's We Care A Lot, and he told me that Dennis Litson from Refuse was singing on it. I was instantly on board because Dennis is a star. He has that kind of energy and voice that roars. That guy will always bring an audience wherever he is. And I love Bill Gould of Faith No More. His bass lines are incredible. The first time I met him, I told him that I was a huge fan. I like the way he thinks bass. His playing is always outside the box, but it's orchestral. He'll take a song and write something that fits so well in a really tasty way. I try to do the same thing with my bass parts, to write a line that goes really well with the main melody. I look around at today's music and I see a lot of amazing, underrated musicians. They're underrated because there's so many of them playing at such a highly technical level. YouTube is saturated with great musicians. I only find out about great musicians when I tour with them, specifically at sound checks that I watch, and if I talk to bass players about their gear, because the rest of the time, life gets in the way. When I come home from tour, I don't want anything to do with anyone outside my family. I don't want to touch a bass for at least a week, partly because my fingers are raw, but also because I need a complete cleansing. I don't want to listen to the latest bass player on YouTube either. After a while, I start to get interested in music again, and I start listening to new bands. I can't wait to work on new music with Anthrax. I learned to compromise over the years. They say a good compromise is when no one walks away happy, and Anthrax is right on point with that. But despite the tension of the writing process, the band are my brothers. I've been with them more than with my own family. Metal was always a rock for me. I could put my headphones on and it would take me away. It was always right there for me, through the hardest times. I'll never forget that. And I hope that people have something like that in their lives that will take them through the ups and downs. It doesn't have to be music. It just has to be anything that they can rely on. If you have something like that, remember how lucky you are. Metal gives me a lot of energy, too. People have often mentioned that they notice my energy levels on stage, and I thank them for that. It's my thank you to them. Every time I walk on stage, I'm so thankful because I get to live out all my fantasies. All the things I feel in life, I let them out, and I don't care. It's primal, like the primal scream therapy that Gene mentions in the foreword to this book. My whole objective is to enable everybody to have a good time. Let's share this energy and get a vibe going. Let's do this thing, the audience and us together, and bring it to the top. That's what it's supposed to be about. See how all of this is connected with being part of a family? After nearly 40 years together, I look back and think, fuck man, Anthrax has been really good to me, and I want to pay it back. I love what we've done, and I'm sure there's a lot more to come. There's yet another rebirth to be had. It's about that hunger. Our work ethic is great, and when we get together in the studio, there's no better feeling than when everybody has their shit down and there's no slacking. Everybody's going to be at the top of their game because everybody cares that much. Nobody's laying back. Nobody's thinking, I'm not into this. Everybody gives a thousand percent. I love that about the personalities of Anthrax. And I love that we still have it after so long. We still want to push the envelope. I can't wait to see what's next. I don't know what it is yet. And I don't want to know. Because I want it to happen naturally without being contrived. We've never been contrived. 
I look back at my life and I realize what a gambling mentality I've had all along. You know what doesn't stand a chance in hell? Joining a band at the age of 17, signing to a major label, selling millions of albums, touring the world, and making a 40-plus year career out of it. Well, that happened to me. So never give up on an opportunity, because there's always a chance. Why not? I didn't know where the fuck it was going at the time. I just knew I had to do it. The process is everything, and the rest is bullshit. The journey is the whole point. I never want to say in my life I should have. Fuck that. Let's do it and see what happens. You know what? I know that if I've done the work and research, I won't fail. Regrets? I have none. Although I think there are things I could have tried. I sometimes think I should have moved to California when Scott did, around 1990, before I was a husband and a father. I wanted to do it, but my family was here in New York, and I didn't want to leave them because I would have missed out on all those great times. Not just the big occasions, but the small ones that are so important, like hanging out and drinking coffee with my grandmother on a Sunday morning. I would never have had those times if I had moved. So, I freeze my balls off in New York and I pay ridiculous taxes, but at the same time, I have all these treasured memories. That's more important than an 80 degree temperature. I'll move to Florida or Nevada when I'm old and withered up. I'll still be youthful in my head. Am I sad certain things happen? Yes. And it's okay to be sad. I'm sorry that we didn't have a normal family unit. When my dad took off, we disbanded. None of that is our fault. I'm just sorry that it happened. We rallied around it, and we moved on. Remember, people deal with worse circumstances than that every single day. Thank God I had a loving family, even if it wasn't the standard dad plus mom plus kids, because a lot of people don't have that, and I'm very thankful. That's why family is my foundation, and it always will be. I want my son to have that foundation, too. And all fathers should know that if they ever think of cheating or leaving their family. Think about what it does to your children. Think about what you're doing. You're pulling the rug away, letting them fall to the depths. Your child doesn't know why this is happening, and it's so fucking unfair. When he finally hits the bottom, he has to build some kind of foundation for himself. And that poor kid is scraping to find anything and climb on top of it and get that foundation to be himself. Now that's his journey, to learn about himself because of what happened. Think about that. Every dad should think about that before he makes a move in that direction. Am I glad I didn't do some things? Yes. The one thing I'm glad I didn't do was take vengeance on the motherfucker who killed my brother. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm glad some kind of light came into my head when I was in that dark place because it changed my path. That light was my upbringing and my family telling me not to do it. I'd be dead or in jail and I wouldn't have my beautiful family and I wouldn't be talking to you right now. This book is a message to you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to it. That means more to me than you'll ever know. If you're a father or a son or a brother or anyone of any gender who loves their family, then I hope this book makes you a little bit stronger and more dedicated to looking after those great, unique people. I also wrote this book for my loved ones, and especially for my son. It says, this is what your dad did, and if I can help you in any way in life, this is how I can do it. I want the message to be, it can be done. Here are the instructions. Use them for your own path. Whoever you are, you can do this. And my other message is that I'm still hungry. Whatever the next stage is, I want to get there and make the most of it. Never say die. Now, I know I'm fucked up for my childhood. My task in this life is not to pass that on to my son and to make his early life better for him than mine was for me. I know I overdo it because I want to protect him from anything like that, but I want to make sure he's safe and I want to make sure everything is done the right way for him. There will be a time in my life when the option of walking on stage isn't there anymore, 
And I hope it's a long time from now because I can't imagine what it would be like not to have that thing that I treasure anymore. I mean it. I treasure the time I have on stage because I feel really lucky to have any of it. It's the ultimate drug that you can't get enough of. That's scary to think of. I want to enjoy each fucking moment. Grasp that moment. That's what I do because life is so short. Make sure you do it too. Frank Bellow, New York City, 2021.